Um, a couple of things before we start talking about electric forces, which is our next topic. First of all, there are, there are sections of the book that are not assigned, but you might find interesting, especially if you're a physics major. And so you can get to all those sections if instead of just going to the reading assignment, you go to the read, study, and practice section of Wiley Plus, and then you can see the whole, the whole chapter and read those extra sections. I've only been able to see chapter one when I get a, uh, I can only list out all of the things from chapter one, that's it. What? Yeah. Okay, you need to show me after class, because that shouldn't be, you should be able to see the whole thing. <coughs> if that's true, we'll have to, I'll have to change what I'm doing, but that shouldn't be happening. <coughs> um, so this access day one thing, did you guys ever finally get a bill for the access day one on your student account? You haven't looked. Has anyone looked? Okay. You, you got, really? It was already paid. Oh, it was actually already paid through tuition on the first week. Oh, so we, oh, it was just paid with tuition. Okay, so that's... <coughs> Second, I want to talk for a minute about... Uh, review something we talked about earlier in the context of the kind of computational models update of position and momentum that you've been doing <coughs> in, uh, in lab. So the momentum principle at least this way of writing it, tells us that if we know the momentum of something, we can say initial or we can say now, we can say final or we can say future. So the momentum of some system a short time in the future is equal, can be determined by the momentum now plus the net impulse applied to it. But when you write a program, you don't write it that way, right? You don't have this initial and final thing. You've got, instead, what you end up writing kind of looks like this. P equals P plus F net And I've seen some of you be a little puzzled and want to keep using initial and final subscripts. So let's talk for just a minute about how this, review how this works in a computer. <coughs> so on paper you might indeed write this and you might write P1, P2, P3, P4 if you're doing lots of, of updates. <coughs> but the problem <coughs> with doing this in a computer <coughs> is that if you're going to do a thousand time steps you actually do not want to sit there at the beginning declaring a thousand variables named P1, P2, P1000, okay, that's not... And so, when we're down here on the 500th update, the fact is we actually don't care what the momentum was initially, because that's been added up until we get to the 499th update and p the momentum on our 499th update has all the history of everything that's been happening to this object. So all we care about is the momentum right now. So instead of keeping track of all of these things, we just keep track of what the momentum is now. And so how is the computer doing that? Well, remember that in memory the computer has stored some things so it's got a value of momentum and this must that's the current momentum and say this is uh, 25 minus 3 2 and it's got some value for F net which is 0, 
minus five zero newtons. And it has some value for delta t, which is, let's say, 0.01 seconds. <coughs> and so what, the what this, this way of writing it says to the computer is, <coughs> look up what, so it's going to do the right-hand side of the equation first, and then set whatever is over here equal to that. So look up what these values are. And so the computer says, oh, OK. I've got, I have to look up P, so that is 25 minus 3, 2. And then I have to add to it this product. So I'm going to do the product first because multiplication comes before addition in the order of operations. So I'm going to multiply 0, negative 5, 0 by 0 0.01. And so I get that to be, so that's the first thing I do. I look up these things. I get that to be 0 minus 0 0.050 Newton seconds. So I, I pick that up and put it there. I pick that up and put it there. I get this result, which is just kind of stored somewhere temporary because I don't really need it. <coughs> now I pick up the current value of momentum. <coughs> and I add that to it. So I get 25 negative 3.052 kilogram meters per second. <coughs> and then what I do with this is I take it and I say, well, I don't need that old value anymore. I already used it. Everything I needed there is, is gone. So I'm just going to put this back here. So I'm going to erase what's there. And I'm going to put the new value, 25 minus 3.052 into this box labeled P. So. So what the computer's doing is just saying, I don't need P1, P2, P30 when I'm working on the 500th update. I just need the last one. And if that's here, I just I pick it up, I use it, and then I put the new value back. And now when I, when I say, well, I need the momentum to get the, the position because I'm going to say V average is approximately is equal to P over the mass, all I have to do is read that up. I need to read up the mass, which is down here somewhere, and do that. So, so this, this equation in the, in the way we're doing the calculation of the computer is the translation of this, this equation. Does that make sense? So think about that when you're actually writing this code, that all you need is the, the most recent value. You don't need all these previous values. You just need the most recent value. And that's what would happen if you did it in your calculator anyway. You wouldn't have stored all those values in your calculator. You'd be using the most recent value. So. OK, because I've seen some puzzled expressions in <coughs> in translating this. So try to try to think about that when you're doing these computational models. Uh, you probably saw my announcement that homework is due Monday instead of Tuesday because we have a test on Tuesday. And you really do want to do those problems before the test. So would you like extra office hours on Monday? Yeah, Monday afternoon. OK, I can promise to be there, but you better come. Because if I have to sit there all by myself, I'll be really bored. So OK, I will, I will post that. <coughs> so last time, 
we talked about gravity, we've been talking about gravitational forces and we we've written the gravitational force by one massive object on another massive object the following way it's equal to g which is a constant times the mass of object one times the mass of object two divided by the magnitude of r squared times a minus r hat where we have one two and if we want the force on one then r goes this way and the minus r hat gives us a force in the right direction which is that way. <coughs> okay? And we explored a little what this meant. We saw that the 1 over magnitude of r squared meant the force decreases really rapidly as these things get farther apart or increases really rapidly as they get closer together. And we thought about the fact that <coughs> how far apart do two objects have to get before they don't exert any gravitational force on each other at all? Can't do it, can you? <laughs> Even when they're really, really far apart, that force is not quite zero. It may be very, very, very small. So small you can probably neglect it, but it's never zero. So everything in the universe is gravitationally attracting everything else in the universe at all times. It's a good thing a lot of these forces are really small or life would be a lot more complicated than it is. <coughs> There's another fundamental force <coughs> that, that looks in mathematical form a lot like this and it's the force between two charged particles. <coughs> now you know about charged particles because they're what make up atoms and atoms make up molecules and that what, that's what makes up everything in our ordinary world. <coughs> and <coughs> there seem to be <coughs> three kinds of particles. Particles that have <coughs> positively ch positive charges and the one you probably know about most is a proton, right? So a proton has a charge we call positive. <coughs> we just write it as a plus. <coughs> and there are things that have negative charges. <coughs> An example is an electron. <coughs> And there are things that have zero charge, like a neutron. We usually write a proton as P, an electron as E, and a neutron as N. Sometimes we do that. <coughs> There's some other particles out there that are less familiar. Um, there are particles that are called antiprotons. We don't see a lot of antimatter around because when antimatter gets next to ordinary matter it reacts violently uh, and gives off lots of energy. So there doesn't tend to be any lurking around in our classroom. Or not much of it at any event. <coughs> but we also might have an, an anti proton, which we call a P minus. <coughs> there are anti-electrons. And how is an anti-proton different from a proton? Well, it's got the same mass. It's the same size. It just has a negative charge instead of a positive charge. Um, there are anti-electrons. Right at E plus, we all, these are often called positrons. 
And there's even a medical technique called positron tomography where, <coughs> where uh, if uh, a living thing ingests something that, that emits positive, it's radioactive and emits positrons, then you can use a detector to actually image what's happening, say, in the brain tissue or other tissues. So positron tomography is a thing. <coughs> and there's other things, too. There are things called mesons, which are made of quarks, but only two quarks instead of <coughs> three quarks. <coughs> so there's, there are pions. They're called pi plus is the positive one. They come in two flavors. Uh, Pi minus, and I forget which of these is the antiparticle. There's a pi zero. There's actually, yes, that's true. There's actually a pi zero, so they come in three flavors. <coughs> there are muons, which are kind of like heavy electrons. Uh, so there's a mu plus, and a, a mu minus. <coughs> So there are just a lot. There are a lot of charged particles. There's more than just protons and electrons, and some of them are cascading through the room, even as we speak. The atmosphere is bombarded. The top of our atmosphere is bombarded with very energetic charged particles, mostly protons, and there are nuclear reactions that happen that result in sort of the creation of a big zoo of charged particles. Some of which actually manage to get down to the Earth. Um, they were once called cosmic rays because nobody knew what they were. So there, there's a lot of stuff around, but... <coughs> um, now it turns out an interesting thing about electric charge in these freestanding particles is that it occurs in... it's quantized in the sense that it occurs in multiples of one number. So <coughs> we use the symbol little e, unfortunately. Uh, to mean the charge charge of a proton and it is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 and the units are coulombs um, so E is a positive number minus E is the charge on an electron. <coughs> and if you have something that has several protons, for example, an alpha particle, <coughs> which is basically a helium atom nucleus with no electrons, it's one of the things emitted in certain it's it's two protons plus two neutrons. We need the neutrons to hold the protons in there with the strong force. Um, its charge would be two times the charge of the proton because the neutrons are have zero charge. <coughs> So how do electric forces work? <coughs> well, they're more interesting than gravitational forces because in gravitational forces, everything attracts everything else. But electric forces can be either attractive or repulsive, which leads to some much more interesting dynamical behavior. <coughs> so we found by experiment that two positive charges repel each other <coughs> and two negative charges also repel each other <coughs> but a positive charge and a negative charge actually attract each other. <coughs> so, 
um, we capture this mathematically by just using different signs for the charges. <coughs> so in this case, presumably the force between two charged particles depends on the charges of the particles. And if we multiply two plus charges together, we get a plus. And if we multiply two minus signs together, we still get a plus. But if we multiply a plus and a minus, we're going to get a minus. So the direction of the force depends on the, is going to depend on the, the charges of the particles. <coughs> and we find experimentally that if we put things, we move two charged objects twice as far apart, the force goes down by a factor of four. So again, we have this one over distance squared uh, dependence. And so, um, we're here, G is 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. So the electric force, looks pretty similar, except instead of mass, what determines the, the force is the charge. And usually we use a symbol Q, either uppercase or lowercase Q for charge. So we're going to have a Q1 times a Q2. And notice that this can be either end up being either a positive or a negative number. Um, depends on distance squared. We need a direction, so here's, here's, a, here's Q1, here's Q2. If we want the force on Q1, uh, there's a constant here, and the constant we're going to write in kind of what may look like an odd way. We're going to write it as the whole constant is 1 over 4 pi <coughs> epsilon 0. Um, and the reason we write it this way is that the, the quantity epsilon 0 is kind of the, the primal constant here. And it, it has a life of its own that's sort of interesting, as we'll see next semester. So instead of using yet another k for a constant, we'll actually just write it out this way. And the whole thing, so 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared, in this case not per kilogram squared, but per coulomb squared. <coughs> And let's see if we're going to get the signs right. So we want the force on <coughs> charge 1 by charge 2. So here's 1. Here's 2. The vector r goes from 2 to 1. So let's see. If this is positive, and let's say this one's positive, then the force had better be away from 2, because this is repulsion. Two positive things would, would repel each other. And let's see. Q1 is positive in that equation. Q2 is positive in that equation. The constant is positive. Something squared is positive. So we get a positive number in the direction of our hat, which is correct. We get a repulsive force, so that's going to work. So if this is a plus three nanocoulombs, and that's a plus five nanocoulombs. 
we get a plus 15 and that would be in the direction of our hat. <coughs> okay, what if this is a negative charge, but this one's positive? <coughs> well, here's R, there's our hat. Now we're going to get, say, a plus. <coughs> We're going to get a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Say this is plus 2 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. And that's a, we'll actually make that negative. And this is a times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. A coulomb is a really big quantity of charge. So this is a <coughs> divided by whatever the distance is squared our hat. Here we get a negative number because one is positive and one is negative. And that says our force is going to be opposite to our hat. <coughs> which sounds right. Or in this case we would have gotten a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 plus 2 times 10 to the minus 9th coulombs plus 4 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. We get a positive number, it's in the same direction. So, so the signs come out right. So, so the, the direction of the charge, uh, the direction of the force, in the gravitational force all we had to do was say it's in the direction of minus r hat. Here we need to be a little more careful because the, the signs of those charges actually determine the direction of the force. <coughs> okay, so let's let's calculate something. Um, let's calculate let's actually So I think you can see that aside from the fact that that we're working with charges instead of with masses, calculating an electric force is exactly the same as calculating a gravitational force. If you can calculate a gravitational force, you can calculate an electric force. They're just not different. <coughs> um, so let's do something here. <coughs> Suppose we have uh, an alpha particle and a chloride ion. How about that? <coughs> so alpha particle has a charge of plus 2e because it's got two protons and two neutrons. <coughs> Here is a chloride ion. What's the charge of a chloride ion? Yeah, minus E, right? Because it's got one extra electron. So it's negative, and so it has a charge of minus E. <coughs> and the locations are, let's say, <coughs> minus 2 times 10 to the minus 9. Uh, <coughs> 3 times 10 to the minus 9th, 0 meters, and 5, negative 1. So talk me through what we need to do. <coughs> Find what? 
start. <coughs> So we want the force on the chloride ion. <coughs> so what's our <coughs> position of the chloride ion minus the position of the alpha particle, right? Okay. So it's going to be R is equal to <coughs> minus 2 times 10 to the minus 9 3 times 10 to the minus 9 0 meters minus uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 9 minus 1 times 10 to the minus 9 0 meters and we get some answer <coughs> then what's the next thing we have to do So we're going to, yeah, we're going to the magnitude of R, aren't we? So we find, which we, whatever we got here, we square the components, add them up, take the square root. Then we need R hat, right? Okay. And so... Then we're kind of ready to calculate the force, aren't we? So the force is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, which is 9 times 10 to the 9 newton meters squared per coulomb squared times uh, plus 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times a minus 1 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs divided by whatever the magnitude of r squared was and whatever multiplied by whatever r hat was, right? <coughs> So do you want to work it out, or are you just happy? Are you happy with this? <coughs> who who is going to be really unhappy until they get a number? <coughs> Nobody. Okay. Now it's sort of informative. I've, sort of, I've said, well, the gravitational force isn't very strong and the electric force is really strong. But it's kind of informative to actually calculate the ratio of the particles to the gravitational force between those particles, just to see how much stronger the electric force is. <coughs> So let's <coughs> take, what was I doing here? Electrons, protons, uh, two protons. <coughs> so we have a proton and another proton, and they're in outer space, so we don't need to worry about gravitational attraction to anything else. <coughs> And this distance is a one nanometer. <coughs> and so what we want to find is the uh, the mag the electric force, which is going to be repulsive, right? And the gravitational attraction between them, which is going to be attractive. And then just take the ratio. <coughs> um, so we'll calculate the electric, we'll call this guy 1. We'll calculate the electric, or we'll just set up the calculation for the electric and the gravitational forces on this guy due to that guy. So the electric force on 1 is equal to 
9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per coulomb squared times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs so that's Q1 and Q2 and then that's over 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared and we're not going to worry about direction right now we're just going to do magnitude here and that's equal to um, So it's about 10 to the minus 38, 10 to the minus 31, 10 to the minus 18. <coughs> Comes out to something like 2.3 times 10 to the minus 10th Newtons. <coughs> now if we calculate the gravitational force on one due to the other proton, <coughs> We have 6.7 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared times, what's the mass of an electron? The mass of an electron is 9 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And another 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared. So actually the, the R squareds cancel out in this ratio. <coughs> and so this comes out to about a minus, it comes out to 1.9 times 10 to the minus 36, I think it is. <coughs> So the ratio of these two forces uh, and here I'm using the notation that an F without any decoration means a magnitude. So if I don't add a vector symbol it's a magnitude is going to be 2.3 times 10 to the minus 10 newtons over 1.9 times 10 to the minus 36 newtons. So it's something like a factor of 10 to the 26th. The electric force is something like 10 to the 26 times stronger than the, the gravitational force. So so this is a powerful force. Is it never possible for gravity to overcome the electric force? Well, sure, but you might need the mass of something as big as the Earth <laughs> or as big as the Sun <laughs> to do it. Um, when just a, a wimpy little electron doesn't have enough mass for the gravitational force to, to be stronger than the electric force. Notice that it's taking the entire mass of the Earth to keep you walking on the surface of the planet. If the Earth were less massive, you'd be kind of bouncing off. <laughs> so, so you need a lot of mass to have a significant gravitational force. <coughs> All right, let's see what we've got here. Um, what does I want? Three point six. Uh, okay. So let's just think about electric forces for a minute. Um, what is so we have two positively charged objects which have the same amount of charge 
say it's two protons and an electron or something like that. What's the direction of a negatively charged object? Okay, take a second. If you don't know, talk to your neighbor. Or if you do know, talk to your neighbor. <coughs> Okay, so what, what's the answer? Okay, we have a lot of sevens, but we've got some other stuff. <coughs> so, seven is right, but let's see why. <coughs> So the force, so this is superposition at work, right? We just have to find the individual forces and then add them up, right? So the force on the negative charge due to this charge points toward the positive charge, doesn't it? So, and the force on this due to that points and so the sum of these two things, if we take this vector and put it here, does indeed come out that way. Questions? No. Okay. <coughs> What's going to be the direction of the net force on the blue negatively charged particle if the positive charges have the same magnitude? Okay, so what's the answer? Seven. 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 Why is it seven? Don't don't both of these blue the both of the positive charges attract the negative charge? Because the is greater on Okay, so we actually have we have to sum up two forces. We've got F one is that way. F two is that way, but as you say, it's smaller because the distance is greater. So we have, I'll draw it up here, F net is that direction. Good. Questions about this? Okay, one more. We have an alpha particle and a proton. Which statement about the magnitudes of the forces they exert on each other is correct? Okay, what do you think? What's the answer? We got ones and twos. And a lot of people who just 
are too tired to raise a finger, <coughs> which is sad because it's only Tuesday. <coughs> so, <coughs> so here's our alpha particle, and here's our proton. <coughs> We're talking about magnitudes. So, if we want to calculate the magnitude of the force <coughs> by the, so they're going to repel each other, right? Yeah. So if we want to calculate the magnitude of this force, we'd have a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We'd have the charge of the alpha particle, which is a plus 2e. We'd have the charge of the proton, which is an e. We'd have the magnitude of r squared. But if we want to calculate the force on this proton, which of course is repulsive, <coughs> Well, we've got a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We've got an E. We've got a 2E. We've got an R squared. Gosh, it's going to come out to the same thing. So they're exerting equal and opposite forces on each other. Just like we saw with the gravitational force, we've got reciprocity here. Despite the fact that this has got a smaller charge, and you can think of it this way, if we have, here's our proton. The proton, so the pro, this proton exerts a force on that proton, and this proton exerts a force on that proton, so our net force is, Well, this proton exerts a force on that proton, and it exerts a force on that proton, and so we end up with the same magnitude of the force. So the re reciprocity applies to electric forces just like it does to gravitational forces. So in the next nanosecond, Whose momentum is going to change more, the alpha particle or the proton? The proton. Oh. Careful, think about it. This is a trick question. <laughs> momentum, momentum, not velocity, momentum. Whose momentum is going to change more? They're the same, aren't they? F net delta T is the same, so the change in momentum is the same for each one. Okay, don't fall into that trap. Which one's going faster? The proton's going faster because for the same increase, same momentum, it's got a smaller mass, so a bigger V. So the change in velocity is different, the change in momentum is exactly the same. Don't fall into that trap. <coughs> okay, questions about Okay, we're now in a position to talk about something that I think has puzzled some of you, which is, what's the big deal about momentum? We keep needing velocities anyway to move stuff, so why are we just even talking about momentum? Why aren't we just talking about velocity? Um, and I keep saying the words fundamental. <coughs> But now we get a chance, because we understand about reciprocity of, of forces, it gives us a chance to really explore another aspect of the momentum principle. So physicists look for, one of the things they look for is things that are all, things that never change, things that are always conserved. And so one of the things that never changes, we think, is the net charge of the universe. Uh, net charge means you add up all the pluses and you add up all the minuses and you get that's a net charge. And so whatever, whatever phenomenon happens 
the net charge of a, a closed system, in this case the universe, can't change. So if we had, for example, an electron that met its antiparticle, a positron, and they annihilate and produce two photons, two particles of light, fairly high energy, we call them gamma rays. <coughs> These are uncharged. So we went from, did, did the charge of the universe change? No, because we went from a net zero to a net zero. So, in the same way we think that momentum is fundamental in the sense that the total momentum of a closed system uh, that's an isolated system that's not interacting with anything outside it, the total momentum of that system can't change. And we're now ready to talk about the momentum of systems that have more than one object in them. <coughs> so up to now we've always talked about the momentum of, <coughs> of one particle. <coughs> but we can write, we could, we're going to talk about systems that have more than one particle and we're going to talk about conservation of momentum and write the momentum principle in the following way. We'll say the change of momentum of a system plus the change of momentum of the surroundings is zero. So let's take the biggest system we can think of, the universe. <coughs> can the universe, the total momentum of the universe ever change? No, because there's no surroundings to <coughs> put momentum in or momentum out. Um, so, but m momentum can flow from surroundings to a system. <coughs> momentum can flow inside a system, so different parts of a system can change momentum. <coughs> um, but unless there's some interaction with the surroundings, the total momentum of a system can't change. <coughs> so a system of two of these little carts here. And we're going to take the system to be both carts. So the surroundings are the track, the earth, the air. Uh, and I'm going to argue that if this implies that if once I give this a push and then let go, so I'm part of the surroundings, but once I give it a push and let go, the momentum of this two-cart system isn't going to change. Okay, so let's see what happens. Did it look like the momentum of the system changed? But this one stopped and that one was moving. But that's okay, right? Momentum flowed from the cart to the red cart, but the total momentum of the system was plausibly the same because it looked like the red one was traveling at the same velocity the blue one had initially. Now, now note that this is consistent with conservation of momentum. And momentum is an interesting thing to be conserved because it's something that's not really that easy to observe. So you have to make some inferences, right? Because you can observe position, and you can see the position changing so you infer a velocity, and then you have to multiply in your mind by the mass, which is the same to get the momentum. But this is the thing that really is conserved through all the processes in nature, whether it's black holes colliding, whether it's electrons and positrons annihilating. Momentum is actually a conserved quantity. Um, now notice that this expression of the momentum principle doesn't tell us 
what the momentum, the final momentum of this card is going to be. It just tells us that the sum of the momenta of the two carts has to remain constant. So we're going to need another principle to make a clear prediction. So we're going to need to get to an energy principle. <coughs> okay, let's try another situation. The momentum, the the uh, the mass of one of these carts without the fan is about. It's I, I measured it this morning. It's 247 grams, and this is a 250 gram mass, which you know from lab. So I've just tripled the mass of this cart. <coughs> So what do you think should happen when you think that momentum conservation thing is still going to work? Well, that's interesting. So we ended up with <coughs> this friction actually there's a confound because once the the mass added mass increases the friction unfortunately so this stops but but in fact we did we did it made it's plausible that this is going to go more slowly because its mass is greater and in fact this card actually reversed it had big change in momentum and actually went backwards what's going to happen here if I do this <laughs> So a lot of momentum flow within the system, but we should we'll we'll have a chance in lab to actually make calculate it and and see that this is this is really happening. Um, so let's um, let us. Oh, why is this not working? Okay. So momentum of a of a system that's not interacting with with other things where momentum isn't flowing in from the surroundings is conserved. Now we could write equations for what we just saw. So we say if the system <coughs> two carts, <coughs> then if we say the change in momentum of the system is zero, then we can actually, that's equivalent to saying P total final is P total initial. And so for the the carts with the same mass, we'd sort of write it like this. Momentum of the red cart initial plus momentum of the blue cart initial is equal to momentum of the red cart final plus the momentum of the blue cart final. And some of these things were zero. So, So initially the momentum of the blue card is zero. We know that because we observed it. And although we can't yet quite predict that the momentum, the final momentum of the red card is zero, we observe that it is. So with some data from observations, we can say that's zero. And so our equation says momentum of the final momentum of the blue card is equal to the initial momentum of the the red card. And we could write similar equations. Here's an interesting one. So there's Velcro on these ends of the carts. So when they collide they're going to stick together. What should happen? but at a slower speed, right? Why is the speed slower? More mass. More mass. So that's an easy one, isn't it? We can say 
um, P blue final plus P red final is P, which one was moving the blue one? P blue initial plus zero. <coughs> but we're, since they're stuck together, these, these two have to be equal. <coughs> so we get two P blue final equals P blue initial. And so we see that the speed is going to be half as great. Right. Twice the mass, half the speed. So there are various ways. So so there's sort of so this is sort of a constraint on what has to happen, and um, and we can use this relationship to solve some kinds of problems, even without having another principle that would let us make more detailed predictions. Um, so here, for example, is a tennis ball falling toward the earth. <coughs> and we can think of this two ways. We can think of the tennis ball as the system and the earth as the surroundings. Or we can take the tennis ball plus the earth as the system. But either way, if the change in the y component of the tennis ball's momentum is minus 0.6 kilogram meters per second, What's the change in the y component of the Earth's momentum? So what's the answer? The tennis ball changes. Kind of looks that way, doesn't it? If we take the tennis ball as our system, the change in momentum of the tennis ball <coughs> plus, and the earth is part of the surroundings, the change in the momentum of the earth must be zero. So if the tennis ball's momentum change is minus 0.6 kilogram meters per second, the change in momentum of the Earth has to be plus 0.6 kilogram meters per second. Would you notice that? No, but it's happening. Okay, it's a tiny change to the momentum of a huge object. But yeah, tennis ball's changing. You're pulling up on the Earth just as hard as the Earth is pulling down on you. <coughs> ball is affecting the earth just as much as the earth is affecting the tennis ball. Weird, huh? <laughs> um, let's see. Sure. Okay, let's do this one. So, <coughs> In outer space, there's a bowling ball floating there, presumably left by somebody from a Douglas Adams book. Uh, um, and a ping pong ball moving in the plus C direction hits the bowling ball and bounces off of it, um, traveling back in the minus C direction. Now consider the interval from just before to just after the collision. Take your system as both balls. What's the change of momentum, the sign of delta PZ for the system of both balls? What's the answer? Yeah, so three, right? Yeah, zero. 
Okay, so you get the basic idea, right? <coughs> now what on earth does this have to do with electric and gravitational forces and reciprocity? <coughs> well, the idea is something like this. Suppose we have a system consisting of two, two objects, <coughs> and then there's a third object here somewhere that's part of the surroundings. So this is our system. And this is the surroundings. Now we're saying that the change of momentum in this system in the next delta t depends only on the interactions with the surroundings, even if these two things are interacting with each other. How does that work out? Well, let's draw forces. Let's say that this, this thing in the surroundings has a charge of, uh, let's say this is plus, plus E and that's a minus E and this has a charge of a minus 10 nanocoulombs. <coughs> So there's, let's consider the forces on this guy. There's a big force <coughs> due to surroundings because it's, this is negative, it's positive, it's attracted. <coughs> this guy has a big force in the other direction because <coughs> it's repelled. <coughs> But this guy is also attracted by that guy. We'll call it an internal force. And this one is attracted by... So if these were at rest, after a time delta t, they will have speeded up coming close to each other. So doesn't that contribute to the change of momentum of the system? Well, let's consider it. So delta P for this is F in turn one. And delta P due to this force is F internal delta T. And since these forces are equal and opposite, this momentum change, these little momentum changes are equal and opposite. And so they contribute absolutely zero to a change in momentum of this system. Whereas these external forces actually do contribute to a big change in the moon. So internal forces cancel out because of reciprocity. And so you could take your system to be a cloud of ionized hydrogen <coughs> and even though momentum would be flowing around inside the system, those changes would all cancel out to zero and you, the only change in the momentum of the cloud as a whole would be due to whatever thing outside was attracting it or repelling it. <coughs> okay. So let's, we'll do a lot more with this later. Um, and you'll find in the chapter a definition of, so we have a definition of momentum of a system. It's just the sum of the momenta of all its, the objects in the system. So it's P1 plus P2 plus P3. So you saw that right away with the cards. Um, we can also define it in terms of something called the motion of the center of mass, which is kind of a weighted average of uh, the location of these things. So if these things had the same mass, the, the center of mass would be there. We're not going to do anything with that right now, even though it's defined in this chapter. We will come back to it in later chapters when we need to use it. But for right now, what we're going to think about is the momentum of a system is just the sum of the momentum of all of its pieces. And... <coughs> So let's actually 
problem and see if we can solve it just using conservation of momentum here. So we have a space satellite that weighs 500 kilograms, has a mass of 500 <coughs> kilograms, it's got a velocity 12 zero negative 8 meters per second and it gets hit by a rock uh, whose mass is only 3 kilograms which is moving really fast though. <coughs> and after the collision we know the rock's velocity, so what's the velocity of the satellite? And if you're like, I'm just not going to bother because I don't feel like calculating something, note that this is a fair game for a test question, so that might not be the best attitude. If you don't have a calculation device, write out your solution, but just don't solve it. <coughs> Okay, what's the answer? <coughs> Not yet, huh?
Okay, how many people actually have an answer? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, that's the right answer. Okay, let's talk about for a minute about how we do this problem just to make sure we're all approaching it right. So, what are we taking as the system? Both objects, right? So, system. And so, what's true of the momentum of this system during this interaction? It doesn't change, right? So, delta P system is zero, which means P final is P initial. So, we have the initial momentum of the rock plus the initial momentum of the satellite has to equal the final momentum of the satellite plus the final momentum of the rock, right? <coughs> now where's our unknown hiding? So we want the velocity of the satellite which is where? Okay, so, so that's where our that's where our unknown's hiding. So we go, the final momentum of the satellite is equal to the initial momentum of the rock plus the initial momentum of the satellite minus the final momentum of the rock, right? What? Yeah, because we know this. And we know that. And we know that, right? Or we can calculate them. Ah, uh, yeah, mass really makes a difference. <laughs> yep. And so, so we can calculate this, we can calculate that, we can calculate that. We get this, divide by mass to get velocity, right? Questions about the method? Yes. I have a small question about that. So, like, could you like um, cancel out n from both sides if you want to, because all terms have n? Well, you can't. You can't. You get no because the masses are different. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so really, you got to work with momentum here. There just isn't. There isn't a way to do it. Doesn't work with. Yes, Robert. Oh, yep. Okay. Answer is indeed two. Please pick up your quizzes and we'll do some more problems related to these in recitation.